this video, I want to look at how Jesus came and dealt with this issue of power. Scripture describes him as the second Adam. The first Adam, we know, really messed things up, and we've been messed up ever since. The second Adam came to show us how God intended we should live, and that includes the use of power. We're using these red lines as a metaphor of power. And when Jesus came to live this second Adam life for us, he encountered fierce opposition. And he had to use power in this confrontation. And you'll notice when you read the Gospels that right before he began his public ministry, he had to work through a temptation. And here's the temptation. It was to turn stones to bread, to jump from the temple so that everybody would see him and be honored by or enamored by him, or to have the kingdoms of the world just granted to him without having to win the people of the world. The temptation here, you look at this, friends, is to use power for his own benefit or to use power as a way to escape his own journey. It's interesting that the very first thing he had to do was to commit to the correct and godly use of power. Now, Jesus had the power to do miracles, but you'll notice that the miracles were always for someone else's benefit. He always used it for someone else. And this was very evident in the very first miracle that's recorded in the Gospels. In this first miracle, we notice some factors about how Jesus used his power. The first one is that it was hidden. It was a wedding. And the people ran out of wine, and it was going to be an embarrassment. And Mary, uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, asked him to do something about this. And he did. But he did it quietly. He didn't do it in front of the whole crowd to be seen. He just talked to the servants and said, you see these stone jars over there? I'd like you to fill them with water, and you take that to the head of the, of the feast. And when they gave the water, which had now become wine, to the head of the feast, he was stunned how good this was, and he complimented the groom for it. Now, the miracle was done quietly, and most people simply enjoyed better wine. Jesus wasn't looking for a limelight, wasn't looking for a way to get in front of the crowds. He just did it quietly. And the second aspect we notice about this first miracle is that it was abundant. There was 180 gallons of this wine. This was no finite commodity. He didn't just give enough to, you know, kind of get by for the moment. No, he did it with abundance. And you'll notice that every time he fed with a miracle, it was always abundant. And it shows that when you share this kind of godly power, it doesn't diminish the giver. Because godly power is generative. And it was freely given. No charge. And then the third thing we should notice about this first miracle is is that it was loving. Because actually, power without love can be brutal. Jesus was using his power in a loving way to shield the family from embarrassment for the lack of wine. And he gave them the very best wine. Now, that's the first miracle. But there were times when Jesus showed his power and it was not hidden. And it was done in very different ways. Let me show you two pictures here. Look at this first one. The picture of the woman caught in adultery. He had power to condemn her. In fact, they said, you should, you should kill her. You should stone her. He leaned down and he did not. Gentle. And at the same time, not the same time, another time, at the same time on earth, he whipped the money changers who were making a, a parody of what the, the temple was supposed to be about. And so when we look at these two examples, we learn that uh, power is intended not always to be hidden, sometimes it's to be visible, and sometimes it's just used in dramatic ways. And then there was a time when Jesus taught his disciples about power and leadership, and that is here in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus called his disciples together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. 
just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Wow, what a demonstration of power. Now, I'd like to take the way Jesus modeled power and contrast it with Nietzsche. Here's Nietzsche's version of power. And then here's Jesus. Instead of power being limited, Jesus shows how he creates more than enough space, plenty of space. People are not the problem with Jesus. People are to be desired. He wants people. His goal is not to dominate and control, but to bless and empower other people, to give them life. He didn't cooperate just to gain from people. He cooperated in order to serve other people. His ultimate purpose was not to seize power, but to share power. Oh, what a difference these two are. And we could summarize these two contrasting views of power with two images. The first image is Nietzsche's image, and that could be summarized in the fist. That coercion is the essence of power. The image for the power of Christ would be one of giving, open-handed, full of life and light. But there's another aspect, friends, that we have to look at. Jesus said, follow me. And early Christians were called people of the way. And in the next video, I'm going to show you the way of Jesus.